The primates of the Paleocene, well, now that's an alliteration, wouldn't have looked much like the primates we know today. However, their time was coming as the Eocene rolled around. With the arrival of the Eocene, the primate body plan began to change. During this epoch, the world was home to two primary primate types. Now, ah, there I go again. The Adapids and the Omamyids. Originally, there existed three ideas for how the Adapids and Omamyids relate to modern day primates, but the hypothesis in vogue seems to be that Adapids are ancestral to modern day lemurs and lorises, the strepsirines, and Omamyids are ancestral to the modern day haplorines, so tarsiers, monkeys, and apes. However, as always, please appreciate that there are some that propose that our ancestors broke bread with ancient adapids instead, and others still that perhaps our ancestry lies with an unknown primate group. If we plucked an Omamyid from the dusky Eocene forests, it would very much resemble a Tarsier. The Adapids, on the other hand, appear more lemur-like. We Anthropoids are more closely related to Tarsiers than we are to lemurs, which is what initially pushed scientists in favor of Omamyids begetting the Anthropoids and Adapids begetting lemurs and lorises. Adapids were ancient strepsirines that likely spent their time clamoring through the ancient forests and basking in the midday sun. Their range is extensive, with adapids being found in arboreal niches all across Europe, Africa, and Asia. The adapids were diurnal, meaning they hung around when the sun was out, and they are the first primates to begin getting large, with leptadapis growing to some 20 pounds. Many of these lemur-like critters were foliverous, meaning leaves were a prominent part of their diet. Novel morphologies were also beginning to emerge, with canines growing more prominent and some species even beginning to exhibit sexual dimorphism, with males having larger canine teeth than females as seen in Nothartis. In modern primates, dimorphic canines usually suggest high male competition and larger group sizes, meaning adapted sociality was starkly different than the sociality seen in modern day lemurs. Lemurs today are often co-dominant or female dominant with almost no sexual dimorphism at all. What was it about the adapids that made them so like lemurs and yet so unlike lemurs. Another well-known adapid is Darwinius massilae from Europe 47 million years ago. This animal is one of the best preserved primate fossils ever found, period. Nicknamed Ida, this individual was found in a lake deposit known as the Messel Pit, which was rich in CO2 back in the day. The reason Ida preserved so well is thought to be similar to the modern-day Lake Neos disaster. Lake Neos is a lake in modern-day Cameroon, and in the 1980s it underwent what's known as a lake turnover event, or sometimes referred to as a limnic eruption. Essentially, CO2, which sits at the bottom of the lake, is sometimes jostled loose, and in low-lying areas, as it erupts to the surface, it ends up suffocating a lot of nearby life. In the Lake Neos disaster, nearly 2,000 people were killed. In the case of Ida, it's thought that something similar happened based off of the geochemical composition of this ancient lake. Ida was likely on the side of this lake, meandering about when a limbic eruption occurred, and she fell unconscious into the waters where she sank to the bottom and preserved in anoxic sediments. Ida is unlike modern strepsirines in a few key ways, however. Unlike modern lemurs, she lacked a tooth comb as well as grooming claws, instead topping her fingers with flattened nails. Ida was found with a full stomach, the contents of which suggest a foliverous or leaf-filled diet. She had a post-orbital bar and a renarium, along with the brain case that's quite large for her body size. Like other adapids and modern strepsirines, Ida also had smaller eye sockets when compared to the omamyids, owing to their diurnal lifestyle. Omamyids had enormous eye sockets, representative of their nocturnal niche, and their teeth suggest an insectivorous diet. Like Ida with modern lemurs, however, Omamyids lacked many characteristics considered typical for modern haplorines. They lack a postorbital plate, which closes off the orbits, and their brain case is still pretty small compared to what their descendants would boast. However, they have lost their split upper lip that strepsirines are known for, again making them most like modern-day tarsiers. And like tarsiers, some Omamyids, like Necrolemur, were superb nighttime hunters and foragers. Necrolemur had adaptations for leaping from tree to tree where it would have pursued arthropods and fed on succulent fruits. Near the end of the Eocene, primates were still mostly observing the world from the trees, and they weren't getting much bigger than medium-sized dogs. 
On the ground, however, mammals had grown supersized in the absence of the dinosaurs. Enormous brontotherium and embolotherium literally thundered across landscapes, sharing the world with the largest terrestrial mammalian carnivore of all time, Andrew Sarkis. The land-dwelling ancestors of cetaceans had long since returned to the sea from whence they came so long ago, and the world continued to cool. Big changes on the surface of the planet and the surface of the primate genome were coming. It was likely an Oma Mayad that experienced the first break in its gulo gene, a break that we humans, along with every other haplorine, still carry within us to this very day. The gulo gene concerns the terminal instructions for the synthesis of ascorbic acid and thus vitamin C. All primates possessing this busted gene must get their vitamin C from their diets. They can't just make it on their own. The break occurs in the same location in all haplorine primates, and given how rare it is in the mammalian class at large, it serves as excellent evidence that this is an inherited trait rather than a break that occurred separately in the same location on the genome in each and every primate species. It's excellent support for common ancestry. The gulo break isn't all bad, however, and it may give the organisms possessing it a superior ability to fatten up thanks to an increased effect of fructose uptake, meaning there is indeed a reason for it to have been favored by evolution, particularly in times of scarcity. Finally, tarsiers are the most basal living primates to have the broken gulo gene, yet further evidence supporting common ancestry. So it may indeed be that modern day tarsiers and modern day anthropoids, that's the monkeys and the apes, share a common ancestor in the form of some distant omamayad. But eventually, the anthropoids and the tarsiers split as well. And anthropoids differ from tarsiers in a few very specific, more morphologic ways. Generally speaking, anthropoid primates have a specific set of traits that include smaller orbits that face to the front and are closed in the back, unique structures in the eyes that lend themselves to vibrant color vision, some derive traits in their feet and ears, and most importantly, larger brains relative to their body size than that seen in strepsirines and tarsiers. The end of the Eocene and the arrival of the Oligocene saw the return of the polar ice caps to the planet, and generally speaking, things got colder. What this meant for our primates is that that their previous range, which basically included the entire world, shrank to the more habitable regions along the equator that weren't as seasonal. Now this would seem quite bad for the primates as it would push them to the brink in most locations. However, the Fayum of Egypt, which at the time was a lush tropical jungle, would be where we find the origin of the anthropoids, the monkeys, which would eventually give rise to the apes. And so next time, during the course of the Oligocene, we will visit the Cradle of Monkey Kind, the Fayum, to meet the first of the Old World Monkeys and the first of the New World Monkeys. 